module, our decentralized application. So I think we've been doing some pretty cool stuff with some module one. Um, however, I think the difference between module one and two is that the module one is a rather established, I want to call it hard science, but something more established. We kind of know what we're going to learn about. Uh, there's um, kind of an enormous amount of data already on the Bitcoin blockchain and also the behaviors of these miners and different um, actors. Now, entering into decentralized application, and usually termed as crypto 2.0, is a much more both exciting but also unknown territory. Um, and I think that's what also makes it really exciting that what we're going to do here, so many of the concepts I'm going to introduce here are by nature or by current state kind of vague, like things like smart contracts. Um, these stuff are not very well defined yet. No one really knows what exactly qualifies our decentralized application or whether it exactly not qualifies. So that's also what makes it interesting. Um, so I think think of the grand experiments, part of the grand cryptocurrency experiment, but the two dollar stuff is really uh, interesting and they not, may not even have to be financial. Uh, many of them are not have application. So let me start by introducing a few basic concepts. So what exactly is a decentralized application? Um, and there's some adjacent concepts of decentralized application. So there's so many different definitions, but I think in general we kind of consider decentralized application as something that instead of relying on a central authority or party to tell what exactly that application does, it will rely on multi-party. And usually that involves some kind of consensus or conflict resolving process that reaches with an end state that multi-party agrees upon. Uh, that application usually, in combination with some kind of um, you know, cryptography and human services, provides certain type of services. Uh, think of that something uh, like you know the torrents, right? Basically, you have multiple nodes and people collectively providing <laughs> services to each other. Um, but the important part, I think, that cryptocurrency introduces to this layer is now you have the ability to provide value exchange instead of a BitTorrent, which is completely you know, a barter economy. I give you one gigabyte of data, you give me the other one gigabyte of data. That's barter. Um, now with the cryptocurrency blockchain, uh, you now have the ability to do a value exchange that actually has a currency component. Now, there are some adjacent concepts that is decentralized autonomous organization and corporation. Um, so the DAO concept comes from, I think initially come from Vitalik, and the DAC concept, the DAC concept, come from Daniel Larimer. They approach it slightly differently. The DAC concept is basically think of the whole network, something like Bitcoin, as the very first autonomous corporation in the world as a corporation. A corporation has shareholders, has stakeholders, you have profit distribution mechanisms, right? So, and the purpose of calling a corporation one of the key things is make it make sure that it's profitable. Because every corporation by by nature should be profitable. Um, and that's why when, when Daniel approaches, Larimer approaches that, he would emphasize is how do you make, make sure that the Bitcoin network at the very end is actually profitable. The cost that miners put in into their mining equipments and the electricity expense is actually justified by how um, the value that is created. So that's one angle appreciated. Now if you generalize a little bit more, uh, I think that's where uh, Ethereum's approaching it is a more generalized organization. That organization doesn't have to be um, a for-profit purpose. It could be very much be a you know fraternity club. It could be a charity. It could be really anything. But it's basically the key part really is more on autonomous. It's something that multiple parties together form a network, uh, just like Bitcoin does. Uh, some of them are dynamic membership. Bitcoin anyone can run a Bitcoin nodes. Or it could be a static membership where someone would specify only certain people would qualify. Uh, but basically it's a network, and these networks together perform certain services, and they have to reach a consensus. Um, so the related to the other concept is the what we commonly call smart contract. Uh, there's, I think, two different, slightly different variation of how to understand the smart contract, and I, think, I don't think there's a standard definition yet. One is secure multi-party computation. So that is a much more technical way of understanding it, uh, but the idea, more generalized way of understanding it, the basic idea is you have multiple parties running, instead of one single party, running one call and not requiring a consensus of other people, now you have multiple parties. These multiple parties are usually bounded, meaning that for the fact, usually you know exactly what is being executed, sometimes you even know who is going to execute it. Um, I think that's the case probably with Codius, where we actually agree on who is going to execute it. So if I trust AWS and I trust um, you know, Yahoo, 
whatever, um, or Microsoft Azure, or these nodes to execute my code. I also agree predeterministically uh, what exactly going to be executed. Um, now, the other way, kind of more simplified way, is you could also consider them basically on chain. <coughs> so if you have an application, um, some part of it requires consensus, and that consensus part you will see on a chain. Now, um, I think that may not be necessarily a dependency. Uh, for example, in the case of Coldius, I believe that's probably not. Actually, you don't have a consensus state. Uh, you just have a smart oracle executing them. Um, so these are two kind of basic concepts. I think it would probably be helpful to have a little chart here um, to look at what are the main differences between these concepts. The first is a classic distributed app. And I would classify something like BitTorrent to be a perfect example of that. Uh, you have a dynamic membership, multiple nodes. Um, each of them have an autonomous decision rules, but there's not much value exchange there. So this kind of limits what exactly can be done. It also impacts the incentive mechanisms um, of all the nodes. Like if I'm da finished downloading a movie, I may not want to contribute back again, right? I may stop being a cedar. Um, and then you have something like smart contract, as you know, in contrast with with DAC and DAOs and DACs. So the main difference I see between the two is dynamic membership. Uh, membership. So smart contract is usually a binded contract. So let's say a derivative <coughs> contract. Usually you have specifying who is your counterparty taking the risk, let's say, of Bitcoin dropping in price. And you as being the counterparty to you know, the other party. So you kind of know who is involved, um, on, at least on one side. Um, now versus a application, uh, and we'll give you a few more examples later what exactly are some good interesting application of DEPs. They tend to be have a more <coughs> dynamic membership. They do not necessarily are bounded to certain parties. Um, the last idea we kind of are exploring right now, more conceptually, is the idea of a smart corporation or considered a crypto corporation. Instead of having a Delaware C corporation that is you know, filed to the states or managed privately, you could basically put move a traditional um, corporation onto the chain such that all your governance, all your services, all your board members, all your um, you know, structure and ledgers or even financial data are moved onto the chain, uh, either private chain or public chain. So I think there's a couple of different interesting concepts here. Um, I'm going to stop here to see if any of these are questions because they're pretty abstract. Did you see Gavin's demo last week about the coin toss thing, people buying into it? Yeah. Not? So how would you classify that? Because it would be dynamic membership, right? You could buy into it. Would that yeah. not be a smart contract, or would that be a...? Yeah, I think I would consider that more of a DAP or DAO kind of structure. Um, I think Devin would call it DAO. So. Yes? No, I think this uh, is probably just a broad question. You know, as you see a lot of models that appear, do you have any thoughts on revenue models? And the reason is because if it is a centralized app, you yep. control you, you you control the rent, right? I, I love that question. I'm going to explain that in a few slides. So <laughs> I'm definitely an important part. I have a comment. I don't know if you can respond to my comment. It, it seems like your uh, uh, I mean I, I would all these you get you got four categories there, and it seems to me like they're all a little bit fuzzy. I mean, you, I mean they are. You you I mean I. I mean, it, depending on your implementation, uh, what you mean by smart contract. You know, I would say one and four is fairly clear or different between two and three. Now, two and three are a little bit fuzzy. And I would generally consider a DAP usually t could possibly very much be in a superset of a smart contract. <coughs> so within a complicated DAP, let's say a casino, that Gavin's favorite example, you'd likely have multiple smart contracts, but you may also have some code that is not necessarily run on chain. Right. So you have a smart contract, and I'll probably there's a graph that actually will show that a little bit better. So uh, bear with me. Um, Any yes. other questions? What is the purpose of the smart corporation? Like, what are the use cases where? It kind of Sorry, can you speak a little bit? What are the use cases where the smart corporation may make sense? Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, so the question is when exactly this smart, con a smart corporation makes sense, right? So I don't have slides for smart corporation, but what we're exploring basically is, and I'm not sure how many of you have run a startup or involved in a startup incorporation or funding process, any of you? All right, cool, pretty good. So any of you involved in that knows how painful it is to do some basic like cap table stuff, right? Cap table is basically just a Word document, it's literally a Word document, that contains who are the shareholders. And usually it's constructed in such an antique way 
that every time you have a new shareholder, you would issue a new share, which means a new word document which says um, XYZ fund has, you know, receiving X amount, Y amount of shares, and they have had X amount of dollars. That's a board consent. So now if you have 100 shareholders over two years of time, in order to construct the right cap table, you would have to manually go through all the cap tables one by one to actually <coughs> construct a final state, just like you would go through a blockchain, except it's all human work. Because it's, all, it's all Word document. That's how you present it to the judge. So that's a super um, kind of outdated system. How do you move something like that into on-chain, such that when a new, the 101 shareholder comes in and say, if I put in a million dollars, do I really get 2% of your company? Right? He can easily verify cryptographically so long as your company, and so that's something I'm excited about what James is doing, because if we can combine that, have a legal binding of the smart contract on chain data into the legal world, now someone can enter confidently and say, I know exactly what the dilution terms are, what exactly percentage am I getting, uh, and what's the impact of the rest of shareholders. So I think that's kind of what I consider smart, con smart corporation. But that's just one part of it. You can do way more with that. that. You could also have your financial data um, privately or semi-privately or publicly um, and move these data onto the chain. So one of the really interesting example uh, that uh, James was mentioning, uh, we had a kind of a conference in MIT and we were talking about, uh, I think there was one presentation from Subledger. So the idea of Subledger is having moving your accounting um, information all on chain. So instead of having, you know, moving your double entry accounting system onto the chain, instead of, uh, you know, just having database operation, that is not signed, not secured, easily manipulated. You completely move to the blockchain paradigm. The blockchain paradigm, you know, basically is everything is signed, so you know exactly who created that entry. Uh, it is also uh, cryptographically secure. Um, it's kind of hard to manipulate, um, so you get all these benefits. So I, I would consider that another use case of part of a, you know, comprehensive smart corporation, which makes you a lot easier for your auditors, for IRS, uh, if you're actually paying taxes. For you know, for um, funding, like if your bank instead of trusting your financial statement in the last year, they could just look at a blockchain statement. And then, and the, and the cool thing about that is you could even do some kind of zero knowledge. So you, we may not even necessarily expose in your co corporate data, but we still trust you that some of your statements are true. Like you have 10,000 transactions or more than 10,000 transactions, but you don't exactly know how many transactions actually happens. A lot of cool things you can do around that. All right, so moving on a little bit. Um, so I think in general, it's conceptually, we kind of draw three circles, and that hopefully explains what are some of the interesting use cases around distributed applications. One is the general larger trend of peer-to-peer -peer economy. Um, everyone, I guess, uses Uber or Lyft to X some, some points. So I think that's an easier to understand. Um, basically, the peer-to-peer -peer economy is, um, I think, two things. One is making traditional intermediary uh, less important and more fluid. Right? You move the traditional taxi companies, which is a crucial component, uh, into something that is more fluid, like Uber. You can have multiple Ubers, um, but the ultimate state is they could transact directly with the software, without even the Uber as a platform. But the idea is really to reduce transaction costs and the trust level. The other big circle is around blockchain. Blockchain is, I think, a really a term for consensus. Uh, there is some shared state. And that's what typically an intermediary platform does. They keep a central state such that the different transacting parties can trust upon. Now in a blockchain, you don't necessarily need that. The third big part circle is crypto economics. Crypto economics, I think, is um, uh, some of you were in the conference, uh, was I think a domain that is dedicated to uh, a combination intersection of cryptography, but more on the economics I would personally consider. Uh, that basically you now have a mechanism to incentivize all the parties to act honestly and providing the value to the rest of them. So I think when we think about DAP, I found that to be a helpful mental framework to see what are the applicants created. Usually starting with a point is something that has to do with collaborative economy. Uh, sharing storage space, sharing computing power, these are simple examples, uh, or sharing rights, uh, more human services. Uh, Etc. And then you look at the two technology boxes and look at how could these technologies help us construct an application like that that were previously not possible. So, um, so one other thing I want to talk about briefly, and we'll probably stop on the conceptual part, is the I think a shift that I kind of uh, seen uh, with different projects emerging um, in the previous world. We mostly have a very server-client architecture. 
where each of the clients would visit a website, each of the company, Amazon.com, hosts their own data center or some server, a group of servers. Uh, now we are moving into a cloud world in the last 10 years. Um, in the cloud world, unfortunately, I think most of the cloud, I would consider them a private cloud. 30% uh, of the uh, traffic is from AWS. And therefore, when you hit some Instagram.com, you're really hitting one part of the you know, AWS cloud. It's a very private cloud that is controlled uh, jointly by the development company, but also more by AWS ultimately, right? You rely on that. Uh, I think what we're going to see in the future, and that's already happening, is a more decentralized internet in a couple of different, two different dimensions. One, I think architecturally, we're more moving into peer-to-peer -peer nodes, uh, where each of the, all of the data, some project like ZeroNet is doing that, I think uh, Ethereum is also doing that in some degree, uh, basically moving all these data to be hosted, um, and also IPFS actually. Uh, is uh, uh, moving these data, website data, into your nodes. So when you hit Amazon.com, you may not even realize that actually these data are hosted by your neighbors, and they become a natural CDN, since that are close to you, physically close to you. On the other hand, that's, that's the architectural part. But I think a more important paradigm shift is really around where does who controls these data, um, and that's I think where the blockchain plays a huge role there. Um, the blockchain creates a common pool, a storage of information that is verified and trustworthy such that previously when a protocol has to reside on certain um, developer uh, producers, now these protocols, especially things like identities or a common protocol like you know, AIM, like Jabber, could just move into the blockchain such that when developers create new applications, they do not, the, the protocol can live longer beyond these developers themselves. So even if that startup created the XMP protocol, you know, it's gone, the company's gone, that's totally fine because all the data and all the protocol structure uh, lives forever, you know, on the blockchain, so on the blockchain lives. So that's, I think, a really important uh, shift is you will see a fatter um, middle layer that kind of captures a really important uh, data there. So that's it. A um, couple of examples of what can DAPs do. I think this is a very uh, early point, so just is what I've been seeing so far. Since like uh, on the computing side, very easy to understand. You have immutable storage, um, computation, bandwidth, Internet of Things. Um, um, in, in the middle, you have since like resource distribution, and that's a big part of it. Because whenever you think about peer-to-peer -peer economy, it usually has to do something with the transaction, nature of a transaction. Um, so therefore, you have a lot of marketplace type of things. Um, you have uh, uh, like insurance, decentral exchange of you know stocks, uh, lottery prediction markets, lending derivatives, digital properties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you also have things like um, human services, exchange of human services. The challenge of human services, unfortunately, I think so far is the proof of certain cryptography to prove. How do you prove someone actually comes to your home and clean it? Right, that's a much harder problem than hashing. So that's the kind of challenge you run into when you have human services. But I think we'll see uh, with IoT, I think combination of IoT, you will solve some of that problem as well. So let's talk a little bit more about technical stuff. So now I think we have a pretty good idea of what exactly, what possibly could be made into a digital application. What exactly it is. I'm going to use the same metaphor um, of uh, traditional programming. You have the NVC architecture, right? So the view part, I think so far we haven't seen too much changes. So let's assume it's still a web type of view. Um, but what changes is now you have potentially two important components. One is the traditional regular model and controller. That doesn't change it quite much, except the, the other part of the model controller is consensus critical. So some part of your application may not require consensus at all. It's a local <coughs> service. Um, it could be rendering you know, some interesting games. These don't require consensus. right? It can render it any way it wants. But then you have the other part of the component that is consensus critical, and that usually to do with some financial data, something of a value, something that is important to that application that requires the consensus of the other nodes. So between that part, if you look at that layer, that you have an application logic that is required consensus. For example, using a casino example, uh, who actually wins the bet? That's a consensus state. Right? You need to maintain that state. And that application logic, uh, you, there could be some middle layer in between, either an API or meta layer, uh, but down the line you really have a blockchain that is a consensus layer. And that consensus layer today most likely will be Bitcoin blockchain or um, Next or Ethereum um, or Coldius type of layer where you actually have to uh, rely on that. And these cold uh, may actually you know, stay on, on the chain. So that's kind of how, you, how, how would I break down uh, the kind of stack. 
um, and uh, the error session that we're going to have soon after uh, this talk is going to, they are actually a full stack uh, that actually trying to solve all these problems to and connect them into one piece. <coughs> so I think that's a uh, really useful kind of mental framework. Any questions so far? Yes. I understand why you put the model in there. I don't understand why you put the controller in, the, in that block. Yeah, so if you think of Bitcoin uh, blockchain, it's mostly a model. It's primarily data, right? Whereas something like um, a smart contract most likely played a role of controller because it gates um, the changes. Um, for example, if I uh, put a bet into the smart contract, the smart contract can decide the outcome, whether you win or not, and based on that, it will maintain or manipulate the state, saying my balance has increased by X. Right, and so that's a controller. What typically a controller does. So I think one easy way is just map all the smart contract to the controller uh, realm. But usually, the contract has its own state, so I guess it's a combination of a model and a controller. All right, cool. Um, so maybe deep dive a little bit into consensus part. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive. They're not exhaustive. They're neither. Um, necessary for each of these smart contracts. But that's some of the components and angles to think about what makes into a consensus crucial component. The first thing I think is really important, the most important part um, is the shared application state. What exactly the state of your application is trying to maintain? Um, and usually that requires some sort of proof of X. Um, in the Bitcoin case, it's proof of your computing power, proof of work. Uh, in some cases, it's proof of stake, that how many stake you have. In, in Lazoo's, which is a decentralized Uber case, it's proof of your movement, right? You have to prove that you're, you actually move the car and drive it somewhere. So there's different way of proof. But ultimately by proving, by taking, so someone is basically submitting a proof, someone is taking, the node is taking a proof and validating that proof, and ultimately based on that proof, they decide whether to manipulate and write into a shared application state. So that's, I think, usually a crucial component of that. The second part to think about is economics. Um, and you asked the question about how do you monetize it? And we'll talk about more uh, about that. But usually you, today, the most common paradigm is you have some kind of digital tokens. Digital tokens represent something of scarcity. So um, you know, by maintaining that token and by gating your applications with that tokens, uh, you find a way certain to create scarcity and economics of value. And people who you know, purchased early into that tokens could also gain. And that could be also be developers themselves who pre-mine these tokens. The third part is membership and access control. And that's something I really like about Eris, and you'll hear more about that, is instead of thinking all blockchain are fundamentally public and dynamic membership, they take down and, and lose that kind of um, uh, relax to that assumption. And now that we're saying, actually, if you, I only want to run a chain that only me and my supply chain, my suppliers and vendors can see it, you can totally do that. And you govern that access control uh, through a smart contract itself, such that it can be self-modified. Um, and the last part is self-governance. What exactly makes a DAO or a DAP improve itself? How, who, can, who can make that call? Uh, so that's a self-governance component. Or in the smart corporation world, uh, you would decide who would be the board members, who are the employees, who get the preferred shares, um, and who get you know payouts first, etc. So I think these are the typical components or angles to think about consensus. Um, all right, so that's the, so any questions <coughs> so far? If not, we'll talk a little bit more about my favorite topic about um, economics. Um, so crypto economics. So this is a broad term. I think uh, a lot last week was talking when